Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we know it's a very busy time of the year and a lot going on in the world and in your communities. So the fact that you could take just uh, an hour and join, join with us today to talk about progress that we've made over the course of this year and, um, and hear from the business unit leaders and also have a time to take questions from you and comments from you. I think on your screen you should see uh, a way that you can both text and email questions into us. We've got a couple in advance, um, but also looking for your questions live today. Looking forward to hearing from you uh, in, this, in, in this format. Let's begin today uh, with a message from the chairman of the board, Dan Schur. Thank you, Jay. I'm Dan Schur. I'm chairman of the board of CHS, and I welcome you to our farm here in eastern Iowa. And on behalf of the board of directors, I welcome you to the 2020 Owners Forum. Back in December at our annual meeting, we talked to you about our purpose and our value that we had refreshed, our purpose of creating connections that empower agriculture, and then our values of integrity, of safety, of inclusion, and of cooperative spirit. Now these values and purpose, they're extremely important to us and they're what we use. They're those lines on the road, on the path forward that keep us centered and keep us creating value for you as our owners. And we use those every day in every decision that we make. We also talked to you in to, at the annual meeting about a bylaw amendment that we would ask you to consider for the 2020 annual meeting. And now this bylaw amendment, it's simple language changes to update the bylaws to the way we do business today, and then to take out some language that we know it's no longer applicable to us. Now please look for in July some more information about that that will come out, and then we will continue to communicate with you in the later summer and into the fall to make sure you're comfortable with what we're proposing and answer any questions that you may have. I'm proud to work with the Board of Directors and work with management to create a future for CHS that will drive us forward. And even in these trying times, we will continue to work on strategy that will make us a strong CHS. One of our values is a cooperative spirit. And you see it uh, more now than, than ever in these kind of times that we're in. It's our commitment to our owners. It's commit, commitment to the cooperative, to our communities, and to CHS and making a stronger cooperative system. Now, later here, after you go back, we go back to Jay, you're going to hear reports from Jay on the finances, what's happening in the company. You're going to hear from our business unit leaders about how their businesses are unfolding and what they see going forward. But just as, as we have done in the past owners forums, we look for this question and answer time and we want to listen to you. We want to hear what your thoughts are because they are the, the information that we take in to help us create that strategy that takes us forward into the future, into a strong CHS and a strong cooperative. So have a good uh, rest of the meeting and please enjoy the rest of your time with uh, Jay and his team. Thank you, Dan. Now, an update on, on the company and on our strategies and so forth. Uh, let me just begin with a fo uh, forward-looking statement um, that we have to make, um, that we are going to be making forward-looking statements during the course of, of, of our time together. Some of those will turn out to be wrong and inc incorrect, and this warning essentially tells you that. Um, let me just begin. We have a quick review of spring, spring's work. We really had good spring business really throughout our trade territory. Obviously there's pockets that didn't have as good as maybe we would have hoped uh, and local cooperatives would have hoped, but when we cover as many states and as much geography as we do, that's kind of our life. Uh, that's what we get, we get, we get used to. Uh, but compared to last spring, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what a, what a turnaround in terms of spring's work and, and, and getting after it. Really nice, really nice to see. Crop reports early on look, uh, look, look promising. Um, into application season, and that's got its own challenges that Gary will talk about in just, in just a little bit. For our first six months uh, in the fiscal year, really good financial performance uh, through far this year. You're going to hear from our chief financial officer, Olivia Nelligan, uh, a little later in the meeting with, uh, with a little more detail on our six month results. And we'll report our third quarter results in mid-July. So um, really the, the impacts from our current months we'll be reporting in, uh, in, in July. 
The value of diversification across CHS, though, is still very much a, of, a, of, of a benefit to CHS, our diversification across energy, processing, grain, and agronomy. Uh, so far, we've had a good year, solid results in our egg business uh, portion of the company and our retail operations. Really, egg business, much better performance than we saw last year, uh, so it's good to, good to see. Saw some good improvements in our grain movement um, this year that we've really been happy to see and happy to bring to the benefit of our owners. Um, trade has opened up a bit. I don't know if it's due to phase one or just better demands around the world, but it's really good to see this, this trade has opened up uh, and our ability to meet owners and owners' demands and move their crops around the world uh, really efficiently moving that product. And it's um, just, just a nice turnaround from what we saw last year at, at this time. Our focus remains on serving you, helping you build your businesses, and helping you build your customer businesses. Um, with the circumstances we have this year, clearly things are different for all of us. We're focused really on three areas as it relates to our current situation with the global pandemic. Taking care of those that count on us, securing our financial strength, and preparing for the future. Uh, which means keeping our head up and looking for opportunities that are also going to come from this time. Just breaking those down just for a moment, uh, taking care of those that count on us, for sure it includes the products and services that we deliver, particularly during spring's work. Um, but it also includes you know, the momentum that we had around other needs that we see in rural America. For example, mental health stress and issues that are, are an issue in rural America and CHS leaning in to help where we can through contributions of money, through training of our staff to help recognize signals and, and, and essentially provide help where we can for people uh, to, to go to resources that are trained to, do the, to, to help in that regard. Uh, it is also about funding food banks in rural America, the CHS community giving funding for those food banks all across the rural areas, our Seeds for Stewardship, which is to support uh, really matching contributions to that local cooperatives make in their communities that we can help in as well. Also our Harvest for Hunger program that is run through our country operations area that again is targeted food banks in, in, in rural areas. Our second is protecting our financial strength and Olivia will talk a little bit about that short, shortly. It's really focused on making the right decisions to stay strong financially in this time because we're gonna come through this we're going to come through this well, uh, but it's going to be because we make changes that reflect the times that we're in. So specifically, we've made changes in hiring, frankly have shut off hiring uh, for, for, for anything that is absolutely not critical really to serve customers. Uh, we've reduced capital expenditures, we've cut expenses, all the kinds of steps I think you would expect us to be taking in times like this. And then last, preparing for the future. So navigating through the pandemic and preparing for how we do business in the future. In some respects, we'll go back to ways that we were doing business that really we've had to put a bit on pause. And in other areas, we're going to look for changes that we have made during this time that really we should stay with. Because maybe we've moved the company and some processes forward in a lot, lot faster fashion than we otherwise would have had the ability to. And so we want to we want to also keep an open mind to what do we keep? What do we stay with? Uh, and then finally, we're going to look for opportunities that are going to come in this time as companies and assets might, might just find themselves out of position. And we want to make sure we've got our head up and are looking for that. Four strategies the company operates under. I covered this at last year's uh, owners forums and at annual meeting. And Dan speaks, with it, speaks to it regularly, as does the entire board of directors. Um, First is creating an experience that makes CHS your first choice, growing our market access, evolving our core businesses, and transforming the business. I want to just share a couple of significant steps along each of those, if I could, for a moment. Making CHS customers our first choice. It's not a coincidence that that's our first uh, strategy. Making it easier to do business with CHS. Um, and we just, we just have to stay focused on that. You have lots of choices. Why do business with us? Making it easier to do business with us is one of those ways. Uh, we are committed to earning more of your business. You've heard me say that before, and we, will, we are going to lean in on hard on that of earning more of your business. 
specific areas around energy, using better data around pricing, around the logistical work that we do. If you look back in our first quarter in the autumn with propane and, uh, and the crop drying season of making sure we're doing everything we can to bring the benefits of CHS to the stresses that a season has. Fertilizer in the spring season, uh, pan global pandemic or not, making sure that we have fertilizer that's ready to go. So, uh, growing market access to add value for our customers. So a couple things I'd point to there. At Fairmont, Minnesota, we have an expansion uh, that's well underway. We finish next year that it's going to increase capacity by about 30%. Uh, that takes more beans from that surrounding area, turns it into products that we can move around the world. Projects on track is going well, few headaches associated with the pandemic, as you can imagine, uh, but project going well. Herman, Minnesota, new grain handling facility, and more investments across the platform. Uh, to evolve our core businesses by capitalizing on changing market dynamics, that means we just got to stay current with the markets as they are, not as we wish they might be. So finding ways to be more efficient inside CHS. So the areas I would really pick to right away that we are leaning hard in in is bringing areas of grain marketing and local cooperatives and country operations locations of bringing the market intelligence that John Griffith's area sees around the world and bringing that information right to the decision making made in the country so that we can bring all of that information to bear to make the best decisions, the most profitable decisions, the, the way that we can bring the most value to the people that own us. Uh, and people could say, well, well, haven't you been doing that all along? Is that, is that new? Well, we haven't been doing it well enough. We haven't been doing it well enough. And, and we're going to do it better. And we're going to leverage the capabilities of the entire cooperative system to bring that value in a better way. Uh, I think it's really, really exciting. You're going to hear a little bit about that in our panel discussion. But it's really how we can bring some value. And it also includes this, this evolution of our business, making sure we stay current to the current circumstances the markets provide. For example, we've turned our two ethanol plants down when those margins were so bad. Uh, they're, they're running back up closer to capacity today. The refineries we turned down when demands went down significantly in the early stages of, of the pandemic. So it also means in this strategy that we stay really nimble and current with the circumstances we have at any particular time. And finally, to transform the business. So we've had good progress on a digital supply chain. It really means being, making sure we have data and better data and cleaner data to bring to our decision making and to bring to how we do business with the people that own us. Um, fundamentally, it's focused at reducing costs and doing better. That's all, reducing costs and doing better. Um, but we are really focused on that transformation that can allow us to do that. As I wrap up my comments, let me just say, so this year is its own year. You know, we, we all went through 2019 and said, well, geez, Good thing that's behind us, it's going to 20. And now we have 2020, which has its own circumstances. At the same time, we're going to be a, you know, a, half, a glass half full kind of people and company. Uh, we'll come through this. Uh, we'll come through it uh, in, 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 the, in the fashion that's the, that makes us the strongest company. And, um, and, and let's just be excited about a crop that's planted and is, is coming along fine. And we're going to be here to, uh, to deal with it as it comes off the field. Uh, thank you very much for, for all your support and what we're doing. Now I'd like to turn it over to Olivia Nelligan for our financial update. Uh, Olivia joined us in late January. Uh, she has more than 20 years experience as a global finance leader. She has really deep experience in a lot of the areas that we're looking to move the company forward in. Uh, and she's just a great person, uh, a great person. I think you're going to really enjoy getting to know Olivia when we're back in person with each other and get a chance to talk to her individually. So with that, welcome Olivia and I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Jay. Hello. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to share this financial update with you. My name is Olivia Nelligan and I'm the CFO at CHS. I would like to take just a moment of your time to share some of my background so you get to know me a little bit better. I grew up in Ireland in a rural community with agricultural roots. I went to university in Ireland where I studied law and business and financial information systems. I became a chartered accountant and a tax consultant. I moved to the US 
in 2006, and I've been here ever since. I'm a U.S. citizen. I did receive my MBA from University of Wisconsin in Madison. And I'm really proud for my family and I to call the U.S. home. Before I came to CHS, I worked in many other organizations. I was most recently, for the last few years, the CEO of a private equity-backed company called NASCO. And prior to that, I was the global CFO and global chief strategic planning officer of Kerry Group PLC, a global multinational with its roots uh, as a dairy cooperative. I'd like to share why I was attracted to CHS and really it came down to the purpose. To create connections to empower agriculture is incredibly powerful, it's meaningful and the fact that this organization is farmer owned and that we all share in each other's success is just very compelling and I'm delighted to be here. I'd like to take a minute or two to go through our financial performance in the first six months of fiscal year 2020, ending at the end of February. In the first six months, we had net income of 303 million versus prior year of 596 million. So an adverse year over year movement of 293 million. However, let me put those results in context for you. You may recall in our energy segment in fiscal 2019, we had very high levels of profitability, which were attributable to a large differential in pricing between Western Canadian Select and WTI, West Texas Intermediate. And additionally, high levels of spreads in 211 crack. So while our results are adverse to last year, we were expecting that. And in fact, we are far ahead of the expectations that we set ourselves for this year. In our ag segment, we finished the half year at 35 million of a loss versus prior year of 18 million of a profit. So 53 million adverse movement year over year. In the nitrogen production segment, we finished at 22 million versus prior year of 34 million. And in corporate and other, which comprises CHS Capital, CHS Hedging, and our joint venture investments in Ventura Foods and Ardent Mills, we finished the half year at 25 million versus prior year of 38 million. We saw an income tax favorability in the half year of about 25 million. So overall, yielding that result of 303 million, which was a very strong performance in the first six months of the year. So as you all know, a lot has happened since February and the effects of the global pandemic and the subsequent economic decline are impacting almost all organizations and CHS is no exception. That being said, I do want to assure you that CHS, your company, is strong and we can weather even the most challenging of conditions. Overall, the business is performing well and while in the energy segment, we have been impacted by declines in gas demand. Our diversification of business is standing to us. Our ag segment has seen some nice pickup in business due to some favorable spring weather in many parts of the country. And because of the impacts of the phase one trade agreement opening up trade with Asia again. I also want to take a moment to remind you that over the last number of years, CHS has really been focused on maintaining a strong balance sheet and that is standing to us at this time. Since we've come into this COVID-19 era, the finance team has quickly mobilized a task force to ensure that we are concentrating on the most important things to ensure the financial stability and strength of CHS into the future. We're focused on the liquidity of the organization, on optimizing our cash flows. We're continuing to ensure that we have a strong balance sheet and that we're adequately funded. We're also focused on counterparty risk and looking at the heightened risk of 
defaults and bankruptcy and bad debt at this time and putting controls in place to monitor and manage it. And finally, we're focused on our spend and expenses to make sure that we are being prudent and responsible to maximize our earnings in this environment. So overall, while we will see the impact financially from COVID-19, I am really confident about CHS coming through this period of time with strength, with resilience, and with an eye to the future. Once again, I just want to say that I am delighted to be on board here. It really is refreshing and exciting to know that there is 11,000 people that wake up every morning thinking, how do we make things better for our farmer owners? I feel privileged to be part of that system and to be a part of CHS and to use my passion and work ethic to drive the business forward for the future. With that, I just want to say thank you and I'll pass it back over to Jay. Thank you, Olivia. So now uh, we're at the portion of the meeting where we're going to listen from, to the uh, business uh, leaders. Uh, I think on your screen you still should have an ability to uh, be able to see how you can text or email uh, questions in. I'm happy to, to take them as, as, as they come in. Uh, the four business leaders are with me uh, this morning. Um, unfortunately, they don't look any better than the last time you saw them. Um, I see Darren doesn't stand as close to the razor as perhaps he might, but, uh, but the, uh, the re we do have the same group. I know you haven't had a chance to see them lately, but, um, but it's good that we've got them uh, t together. Gary Halverson heads up uh, agronomy and crop protection products. Uh, Rick Dusick heads up uh, country operations. Darren Hunhoff, cooperative resources processing food ingredients and the energy platform, and John Griffith, uh, who heads up CHS hedging, our ethanol production and global grain marketing. So um, the four people that I'd just like to uh, kind of listen to and, and allow you to listen to uh, a little bit more detail uh, for things going on in their businesses during this time. So you all heard me talk just a little bit about kind of a spring update at a, at a high level. Maybe you could just, um, Share with, share with the group both the spring update from your perspective and also maybe just a little bit of a look going in the next few months. Um, not necessarily the next year, but the next few months, how you see things on, on, unfolding. And, uh, and, and Gary, I know in your area, particularly with, with some of the recent court rulings, it's kind of upended some things, so maybe you might want to focus on that a bit too. Sure, thanks Jay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so spring went off, I think, as close to normal as we've seen for a while. Spring planting started in the south and worked its way north. The supply chain um, wasn't uh, impaired in any way, and so we were able to maximize both Galveston, the import facility, our investment with CF Nitrogen um, and the Port Neal asset in the upper Midwest watershed, as well as the river network. And everything really worked very well. Now, it's not perfect everywhere, but a better spring, certainly, than we've had for the last couple. And so, you know, the crop went in in good shape. Um, the fertilizer business will see a market reset, and I think that's something for folks to think about. Here is how do we look into the fall and into the future. And the crop protection business, uh, you mentioned the dicamba issue and what's been going on recently. Uh, we've still got a lot of spraying that needs to be done. This crop is, is ready to be sprayed or being sprayed currently. And we're dealing with, with the kind of the tail of the Ninth Circuit Court's decision in and around some dicamba products and they're vacating the label J. So that's, that's really where our focus is at for the rest of, rest of the summer is taking care of the crop and making sure we get as many bushels out of this as we can. Good. Rick, how would you kind of see your spring and maybe your, your, your outlook as well? Yeah, so uh, good morning, everybody. Um, you know, I, we look at the spring, Jay, and it was a successful spring. Certainly much, much better than a year ago where, where you know, everybody in the industry knows the challenges that we've had. But considering the challenges that we had with COVID-19 and, and the workforce, uh, I, I, I just look at our, the execution of our staff and how we were able to deliver the products and services that our farmers needed to get the crop in the ground, it went very well. And to Gary's point, you know, there were some areas that got in and got, got going really well. Uh, some areas, particularly in the northern tier, that were a little bit later because of some cool, wet weather. 
But overall, the crop got in in good shape, and we were very, uh, you know, pleased with the resiliency and dedication of our staffs to get to get the job done. Now we're looking forward to the growing season and and delivering crop protection and and those agronomic services to make sure that we keep the crop healthy and keep it moving. Uh, you know, through the summer. And so far, conditions look pretty good. Again, there's some spots that could use some rain. There's some spots that had a little too much. And, you know, there, you know, there are different challenges. But overall, the start looks very, very good. And, uh, and then additionally, there's still a fair amount of old crop grain that needs to move. And, you know, we're, we're, we've got all our procurement staff and merchandising staff really looking at, uh, is, if, is there going to be volatility in this market? Will there be opportunities? And really engage with our our farmers to, to help them market both old crop and potentially look at some opportunities for new crop. What's going on with old crop right now, Rick? People are kind of finished planting. Are you starting to see a little bit of movements come back into the market? Yep, finished planting. And, you know, prices are still, you know, the, the burdensome supply in the world still exists and prices aren't where anybody wants them. But we have seen a bit of volatility here over the last couple of weeks, so I think there will be some chances. And I think everybody's coming out of planting. They're worried about taking care of their crop. But I think over the next few weeks, there'll be a bit more focus on, on moving potentially some of this old crop. So hopefully, it, it'd be, get a little volatility and get, bring some opportunity to market some grain. Darren, uh, clearly these last couple of months have had a big impact within, uh, within our energy platform for reasons that everybody's reading about in the newspapers. It's, just, it's, it's, it's the world that we have uh, processing some impact too due to food service. But what could you say about how you've kind of come through this spring and, and your outlook uh, in some very challenging times? Yeah, thanks, Jay, and good morning, everybody. Uh, it has been uh, quite a whirlwind of change in both energy and processing uh, this year, even over the last 90 days, it feels like we've almost lived through a few different years uh, of change uh, in a very short period. And clearly, uh, some, some portions of our energy business and our processing business uh, continue to really feel some effects uh, from COVID-19 and the pandemic uh, effects around the country and around the world. Uh, to Jay's point, uh, you know, I won't, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on what has happened, but you know, just quickly, uh, gasoline demand uh, really decimated uh, across the country. At one point, uh, the EIA statistics had uh, gasoline demand domestically down 47%. Uh, I'm glad to share that we're coming back out of that pretty quickly. Uh, as recently as yesterday, those, uh, those numbers show more like about a 20% uh, versus uh, the previous three-year average, uh, those are still just just staggering numbers. And in past years, I would have been uh, talking about two or three or four percent changes and a big impact on the industry. So, never seen this before in the, in the industry that we participate in. Uh, I think those headwinds uh, will continue. Excuse me, uh, into the summer in our refined fuels business, but they're shifting. What I mean by that uh, is, is you've read a lot about the gasoline effects. Uh, you've all seen crude oil prices go from literally negative prices back up to something that, that feels a little bit uh, like normal in, in the $30 to $40 range. Uh, our mind as we go into summer and where we really see a headwind is on diesel. Um, you know, our own diesel sales have been tremendous through on the heels of a, a solid spring that my colleagues mentioned. Our diesel sales as a cooperative system are actually around the normal, if not a bit above. But, but for the world, diesel is, is coming down. And if you just think about it, uh, not many airplanes flying. Uh, it, you know, that industry has is, is really felt the effects of that. And that jet fuel uh, doesn't just go away. That jet fuel ends up in a distillate pool. So we have a distillate production come up, uh, export demands uh, also down as we have global uh, slowdown in, in, in just commerce. And then right here in this country, between, uh, between airplanes not flying, uh, red rail freight down significantly, we're seeing diesel inventories rise a lot. And that's the more, uh, the more, challenging, more challenging part of this as we head towards summer. Uh, quickly on uh, processing, I'd maybe start the conversation uh, this morning there on the ethanol part of our processing platform. And uh, I'll call them the follow-on effects uh, to ethanol from what happened with gasoline demand. Certainly the demand for ethanol is going to track right with that. And so we've seen uh, just 
tremendous impacts on that. Uh, you've all read about production of ethanol coming down significantly. I'd, as we look towards summer there, we are seeing some nice recovery, um, really nice recovery. Inventories of, of ethanol are kind of coming back into a normal range. Essentially enough production was taken out uh, by the industry and then with the demand coming back up, we're in a lot better place than we were uh, just a few weeks ago. So Jay, that's a couple things we could talk a long time about the effects in these businesses. Yeah, we, we certainly can, particularly in the, in the energy platform, because that's, that's really an impact around the world, uh, just not on CHS and just not on our markets. Um, and to your point, while demands in our markets could be pretty strong, we live with things priced in a global environment uh, with global demands. So John, this year, uh, what a change from last year uh, at, uh, at this time when um, when exports just were not were not part of the picture, at least exports from the United States. Um, this year, better um, so far. So far, how do you think about you know these last few months in your business, and maybe an outlook going forward a little bit for demands and exports? Yeah, sure, Jay. Uh, good morning, everyone. You know, as, as you heard from Rick and Gary, the, the spring planting season uh, went well, uh, and so we're, we're comfortable with that. Around the world, uh, you know, crop production has remained strong, and so we have, uh, you know, big crops and a, and a lot of bushels around the world to trade, um, and that's a good thing for our business. Um, this spring, you had two things happening at the same time. You had the, really the, the implementation of the uh, trade agreement, uh, the phase one with China, uh, and you had the, the COVID disruption happening at the same time. That was good for our business. Uh, we saw in, in CHS hedging, the volatility uh, across uh, energy, ag, and uh, livestock products uh, create volume and opportunity. That also created opportunity uh, for our cash uh, trading business as well when we did see uh, you know, China start to really engage in purchasing U.S. goods. Um, and you can, you can you know, slice it between the execution of the phase one agreement um, and you know, some reasonable prices uh, to fulfill demand and probably some diversification of sourcing that's uh, prudent when you've got a global pandemic happening as well. So all of those things seem to converge uh, over the last few months and really continue again this week. I mean, we've had uh, some pretty significant activity uh, with China on soybeans just this week. Uh, there was an announcement this morning, I think, with nearly three quarters of a million tons of soybeans sold to China over the last couple of days. Um, and so this has uh, just been a really consistent flow. And as Rick said, you know, as, as we come out of the field and the crop is growing and there's still some a substantial amount of old crop out there, um, we're finding homes for that and, and we're putting together programs and lining up our logistics and, and uh, hopefully providing you know, good markets or as good a market as available in the world today um, for our owners and, and for all of you to, to market their products, Jay. So um, we feel pretty good about that and we feel pretty good that that will continue uh, you know, into the summer. Yeah, it's really good, good for us to see both as a company of CHS but also for the people that own us that markets are working a little bit in ways that um, a little bit more dependable in some respect. We're not going to brag about the price, uh, but frankly, we don't set that price. Uh, the, the, the world does. Um, but at least if we can have the product movement be a little bit more what people can kind of depend on, uh, I think that'd be a good move for this, for all of us. Uh, let's, let's just kind of transition a little bit to maybe some trends in your industry that's a little bit for, more forward thinking that, uh, that are on your mind and then you might think um, we want to share with, with the people that own us uh, uh, that, that you think could help them or that they should be thinking about as well. So let's start with agronomy space, um, Gary, and how you're thinking about maybe some trends looking forward. There's some really interesting transitions that are happening. We've spent the last couple um, owner forums, Jay, talking about digital transformation and how that's impacting agronomy. And now we're seeing new market entrants with, with uh, products manufactured overseas that are finding their way around the traditional channel going direct to farmers in some cases. 
And you know, there's aspirations from these companies of something like two, three, four percent market share gains over the next couple of years for each of these companies. And when there's five of them, it, it adds up, it makes frankly. A, it, makes a difference. it makes a difference. And so that's something I, you know, I'd encourage all the cooperatives and all the owners to be thinking about how do we get closer to our farm customer? You know, what, what effort can we put into to providing solutions? And then really, you know, cleaning up our supply chain so we're running a, a lean, efficient organization and, and we're being impactful with the decisions we're making in and around every product and every ap application. Um, and that's a, that's a nuanced difference from just a simple digital way to get to the customer. That's part of it, but now it's, it's these, these new entrants with new products and how they're going into the space. So it's, it's definitely a shift, Jay. All right. Rick, I know trends in your platform vary everything from people increasingly want to do business at non-traditional hours and non-traditional ways, uh, and yet still m many of our customers want to do business in more traditional ways, and, and that's just our world. Mm -hmm. That's right. So a couple of the trends that, that I think are very relevant to the retail business, Jay, is, you know, number one is just the evolution of the competitive environment around the supply chain. And what we're seeing is, is competitors, very large, well-capitalized competitors, really continuing to integrate the supply chain, create more efficiency, connect that farm to the global market and vice versa on, on inputs. And I think what it, you know, where, where it's driving us is to really look at how we can leverage our business across you know, my colleagues, the wholesale businesses with retail, take a lot of that transactional noise out of there and really make sure we can pass information and efficiencies up and down that supply chain. Because if we don't, I think we're gonna find ourselves uncompetitive. So that is really a trend that we're working very diligently on. Secondly, to your point, Jay, is around the customer and how we engage that customer uh, digitally and, and otherwise. And, and we're working, uh, again, diligently to raise our game on the digital interaction, uh, both exchanging information and starting to conduct more business. But then overall is the overall customer experience. How can we provide more solutions for farmers as we go forward in the way that we interact with them and bring the full, let's say, size and scale and position of CHS in the marketplace to that farmer to create as much value as we can. Right. So Darren, trends uh, in, 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 in energy particularly, but maybe also related to processing, you know, it's, it's hard to get the current circumstances out of your mind and entirely as you think about trends going forward because some of the trends have been underway, but maybe some actually have been accelerated just, just a bit in this window too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree, Jay. In, uh, in this, you know, current circumstances we're under, it, it is a little bit hard to, to think further out about those trends because there's some things we got to watch right here and now, and I'll say through the next six months that are just going to be really critical to both our processing and our energy businesses. And, and I might just start with processing, something I didn't talk about in the, in the earlier question that we're going to be watching really closely is just how particularly in this country, but to some degree globally, what, what happens with the restaurant and food service industry? Um, you're all aware that uh, restaurants across the country uh, shut down for quite a period of time, just now beginning to open up. And so it, it sparks questions, you know, how many of these restaurants survive? Um, how do the American people think about eating out? Uh, will schools start up and uh, some of the food service activity really start up again like it was? Is that is a huge demand source for the outputs of our processing platforms, particularly uh, for soybean oil and canola oil, as you, as you might expect. Uh, we have seen initially these, these products uh, begin to come back, but we think there could be a bit of a rocky road there and it's, it's critical to our business. So that's one I think as a whole system, we just kind of watch, see where that takes us. Um, on energy and in, in that kind of summer through the fall, I just emphasize again, I, I think distillate and diesel is the, is the product to watch. What happens with global demands, what happens with exports, what happens with inventories and refining uh, production, I, I just think that's really going to be a dynamic piece of the recovery. We think just a little bit further out, you know, it, we continue to plan uh, that that there were more of an energy products, particularly uh, gasoline, uh, sold yesterday than there will be uh, tomorrow. Now we've got lower prices, uh, and so do consumers respond a little bit, a little bit slower to electrification and other alternatives when the street price on gasoline is considerably lower. We'll be watching that, but we will continue to plan uh, as if uh, demand is, is flat to lower in, in some of these products. 
you know, Gar or, uh, Darren, uh, you know, we have the investment in Ventura Foods and, and what they would say just echoes what, what, what you said around restaurants and just in terms of it's really uncertain, all the restaurants that are closed right now, how many actually can come back? And a lot might come back to begin with, but can they, can they sustain? Uh, has their customer base changed? Is their help not there like they had hoped it would be there? And so it's really going to be interesting to see just what effects in that food service industry really, I don't, I don't think, day one isn't going to tell the whole story. Uh, it's gonna take a little bit of time to sort that out, unfortunately. So John, you heard me talk just a little bit earlier about uh, you know, work that, that you are doing, Rick is doing, and doing with local cooperatives of trying to make this supply chain be more efficient. We've been talking about that. You're actually bringing some of those changes to bear. Um, and, and I think that's, that's got to lead some of the trends that you're seeing in your business of our need to be able to do that um, just because we, we can't count on margins just magically getting better. So we better do it better ourselves. Uh, maybe could you speak just a little bit to how you're thinking about some of those trends? Yeah, absolutely, Jay. And, uh, you know, that's a really great point. Uh, we don't anticipate any big supply shocks or demand shocks anywhere in the world at this point. So uh, we have to anticipate that the growing season will be normal. Um, and with that, we're going to have a lot of grain to handle uh, around the world and, and through all of our systems. We've been working really hard uh, in concentrating on the phase one execution uh, and, and capturing uh, that, that demand that we're seeing come to our marketplace, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we've organized ourselves in a way in global grain marketing and a product line approach globally and have really worked hard to digitize our supply chain and connect end to end. Um, and so that we've really got our shop in order here uh, and can communicate and connect uh, the supply chain end to end uh, to capture the, the opportunities. And I think we're doing that. Um, I see market share gains uh, come into the cooperative system. Uh, I know that, that we're doing a, a good job at uh, participating in all of these, uh, these events uh, and that feels really, really good. Um, you know, as Olivia talked about, you know, counterparty risk management is, is a big deal as well. Um, and it's not just about the transaction anymore. And it's not about all the transactions that happen in between. It really is about the end to end, um, knowing where we can bring value back to the producer through our system and how we connect that to that key customer that's in the market that day someplace in the world. Um, and so, you know, the, the counterparties and the risk that comes with a COVID environment and with, uh, you know, a politicized environment around both that and uh, one that is, is more protectionist in the world, there's just a lot of potential volatility that, that we all have to manage together. And I encourage everyone to, to be really thoughtful about that. And, and we certainly are, as you heard from, from our CFO, how important that is. Um, and I think we, we can do that together. Uh, and as I said, it's less about the transaction and it's more about connecting that end-to-end -end supply chain um, and communicating very quickly and efficiently with uh, good information, accurate information, and actionable things that we can do together. And I think that will make the, the entire cooperative system much stronger, Jay. Yeah, and it's, you know, John, it's but what, what you've, been, you've been talking about, we've been talking about, the board's been talking about for the last three years about our need to do this. Uh, you know, to bring the resources of the cooperative system better together, to respect, you know, that, 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 that we've got lines that mean that there's, there's different companies along the, along the chain, but we also can't just hide behind those lines and not try to do it better than we've been doing it before. Um, because we have a lot of benefits that we can bring, you know, together with knowledge at the local level, of knowledge in the global level, and that I think, in the end of the day, makes us all do better. And that's hard work. It's hard work. Um, but we're going to get after it. And I think uh, you with local cooperatives, you with country operations locations, have been able to find ways, particularly this year. I've just really seen it. Um, more work to go, though. More work, more work to go. Uh, we're not really a group that uses words like done or finished. Um, and we're certainly not going to start using them uh, today. So uh, I want to take some, make sure we've got time to reflect some questions that have come in from, um, from people on the phone uh, or in advance. And um, because that's, that's, that's part of benefit of, 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 this, of this meeting. 
So let me, um, somebody will magically hand me questions that are coming in uh, as we speak, but let me, um, don't laugh about the glasses, you'll get there too. Uh, let me uh, just say uh, that one question came in, that CHS has fewer employees than in the past. I'm guessing strategically that was by design as you've right-sized the workforce and sold some assets. Are you feeling about your ability to attract and retain talent in rural America? And I'm gonna ask uh, Mary Call Hottinger to, uh, to join me in this answer. Just know that if, if, if there's an item I spend um, um, as much time as any on, it's around talent. And um, yes, clearly we have reduced some expenses and really limited hiring uh, in, in, in this time, but know that we very much appreciate the need for high performing talent all through our locations and that challenge has not gotten easier. Um, Mary, maybe you could speak just a little bit more to specifics about that. Sure, Jay, thank you. And, you know, we continue to do well in rural America, but it is a challenge. And, and the question has two parts. It's both the attraction and the retention part. You know, on the attraction part, we are working hard with our talent acquisition team to better organize to support recruitment in rural America. We're putting in a new system. We're putting in new resources and tools to support that. So we're working hard on the attraction part. But in addition, we have to work on that retention part as well, and that's critical. And so I like the question asking both elements of that. You know, we're doing a number of things to increase the retention of talent. Um, first of all, through our inclusion work and our inclusion strategy, we wanna make sure we're a welcoming environment for diverse talent, that people can bring their authentic selves to work and do their best work here. We're working on job and career paths to make them clearer for employees so they can understand what their careers would, could be like here at CHS and take advantage of the opportunities we have. And we're regu regularly um, getting input from employees through our engagement surveys. And so these are just a few examples of some of the things that we're doing to retain employees um, as well as attract them. Yeah, Mary, I mean, it, it, I guess it's safe to say that this, the, the talent issue, this, the current circumstances don't make it more difficult, less difficult, it's always front of mind for us. The, the, the companies in rural America get, get larger and larger and larger, more sophisticated, and our need for talent just grows. Absolutely, and it's not just the work of human resources, it's the work of everybody that's right. sitting here and is a big part of that. Right, as well. no. yep. fortunately, we got a good story to tell. We do. We're about something bigger than ourselves, we're about helping feed the world, uh, it's, it's a terrific story. Yeah, the purpose really resonates now with our, our candidates, absolutely. Right. So I'm gonna uh, ask Olivia Nelligan, uh, her, her, her first chance to answer, answer a, a question during um, an owner's forum as, as CFO, but I'm gonna ask her to join, um, join in this one. The question came in, can you explain how income tax is a category of, of, of income? So uh, Olivia, with the magic of technology, could you help us on that one? Um. Of course, Jay. Um, thanks for the question. Um, and yes, yeah, sometimes the way we present financial information can um, be a little confusing. So let me clarify. So the income tax is not a category of income. It's a deduction from our earnings to show you the net number. So what we're effectively showing you is an abridged version of our profit and loss account, which is what we publish and file in our SEC reporting. Um, and the definition of net income is actually governed by GAAP or generally accepted accounting practices. So the goal of the net income number is to show you our earnings net of any tax impact, whether that tax impact is positive or negative in any given year. Thanks. Thank you, Olivia. Um, Darren, one, one for you. Can you speak, this was a recent announcement I think that came out in some industry publications just in the last two weeks. Uh, can you speak to the supply outlook in Rocky Mountain region with the recent Holly Frontier, which is another refiner, uh, announcement regarding the Cheyenne, Wyoming refinery. Yeah, sure, thanks Jay. And for those that uh, might not be familiar with the region, uh, the Holly Frontier facility in Cheyenne, Wyoming uh, is, is long been a part of that region and uh, supplied gasoline and diesel fuel. Holly Frontier was recently public with their decision uh, to, con I'll use the word convert, convert that refinery from what I'd call a traditional petroleum refinery that brings in crude oil, turns it into gas and diesel, into uh, a renewable facility that would bring in uh, inputs such as uh, refined soybean oil and turn it into a product called renewable diesel. 
And uh, there's a lot of reasons why they may have done that. I'd, I'll let them represent their reasons for doing so. Uh, but it has a lot to do with all the programs around uh, renewable fuels uh, across the country and also specifically on, on the West Coast. So I know that uh, customers in that area, and I would, I would suggest our early thinking is the products made there, uh, you can't assume will continue to serve that local market uh, because of the dynamics around the, these renewable products. So I, I think, frankly, the market will just have to adjust. Uh, we can get to that region uh, actually with both of our facilities. Uh, Laurel can move product down in, into the Denver market. McPherson can move it over to the Denver market. And you know when, when you take that production out, it'll take some time for the market to adjust both supply and price. But that market will get served, will be committed to serving that market, and it'll take a bit of time to see exactly which, which pieces of the supply chain uh, shift around and, and fill that gap. Thanks, Darren. So Rick, a, a question came in uh, related to I think some announcements that came out this week. Um, and the question was, can you give us a little more detail on what was sold in Michigan? Well, to be, to be clear, we haven't sold anything yet. Um, we're, 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 we're in deep in discussions and, and, with, and you can talk about that. But just to be clear, we haven't sold yet. Uh, local cooperatives that we're involved with are doing their own due diligence and, and, uh, and the CHS board is still discussing this I, I, I issue and so forth. But could you tell us a little bit more? Sure, sure. Thank you for the question. So um, we've entered into a letter of intent, which, which obviously is non-binding at this point, to, uh, to sell um, our, our country operations business unit assets in Michigan to a couple uh, member co-ops, Series and, and Co-Alliance. And the reason for that is, is directly linked to our strategy. One of our strategies is evolve our core business. And underneath that strategy of evolve our core business, we're very deliberate in country ops to continue to prioritize our, and optimize our footprint and the assets that we have in country ops to maximize the value of our four core businesses, which include grain, energy, and processing, and agronomy. And when we look at our assets in Michigan, uh, really the, the only supply chain that that's meaningfully collected, connected to is agronomy. And, and although that connection is good, when we look back in, in, in history, we all know that we had a, a, an issue there with a large producer loan issue, and our reputation has been challenged in that issue, so it's just hard for us to grow. So, uh, uh, and again, dr linked directly to our strategy, our, what, what our uh, view is and our goal is, is to reposition those assets with a couple of very good member co-ops that we know will run it well, and then take the proceeds and reinvest in retail businesses that are closely, more closely aligned with our core businesses. And we have numerous opportunities, whether it be organic growth or through M&A, to do that, and it creates more value uh, you know, for, for the entire system and creates more value to those farmers that serve. So that's the intent behind that. But again, to just to emphasize your point, it's a letter of intent, and we still have more diligence to do before we would close any deal. Thanks, thanks, Rick. And I'll, I just want to step back from this issue just a moment because this is something that you've heard me speak to. I think you've heard the chairman speak to it uh, and um, over the last several years. When it comes to the retail platform, we are going to look at, at the portfolio and look at assets that maybe don't fit us anymore, aren't performing, are better held by somebody else, and we're gonna make decisions uh, if we think that that's in the best interest uh, of, ev of everyone. Uh, and I know that sometimes those decisions won't be popular, and I know somebody's going to ask for something that frankly, we're in no position to, uh, to, to, to make a transition with. Um, and, and also, we are going to make investments where we think that that's necessary uh, and helpful and beneficial as well. So um, what you're seeing here is one example of this. And, um, and I won't say it's the last one, but you're also going to hear, and as, as I mentioned about building a uh, grain handling facility at Herman, Minnesota, where we are investing in assets. And that's, that's what we are in. We're also want to make sure that we are open and looking for partnerships that also allow us to do a better job together. Uh, and that's, you know, that's also work that's underway with, in various locations with various opportunities to say, well, let's, respect, let's respect the companies that we have, but how can we still do things better knowing that, that, that partnership might be the avenue to do it in. So I, I think this is very much in line with what we've been speaking about. You're, just, you're seeing it come to life. Um, and and, I, and I, I hope you feel good with that. Um, 
John, maybe uh, one, one for you, just a question, very simple question. How is South America performing? Um, so we've, we've had some challenges internationally in the past. You and Brian and your staff have been leaning in heavily to improve our performance. The world is a complicated place. South America is at least as complicated as everywhere. Um, but maybe could you just speak a little bit to how we're doing? Yeah, thanks, Jay, and, and thank you for the question. Um, and you're right, we have, we have struggled in, in South America over the years, um, but I'm, I'm really proud of the team and I'm really proud to report um, that we're having a great year in South America, uh, particularly uh, in Brazil, which is one of the areas that we were really challenged in. Um, we have more than doubled our volume down there um, and the, the operation is profitable. Um, and so it is working really, really well. Um, I mentioned also a little bit earlier um, in my comments about us putting together a global product line approach. Um, and so we have really focused that team in Brazil on just origination. Um, and it's an origination arm that helps bring arbitrage and allows us to serve primarily Chinese customers, quite frankly, um, and allows us that arbitrage back to the U.S to provide markets in a better way for, for all of the owners here in, in the U.S. So uh, really proud of the work that's been done down, down there. Um, Brian and Horatio, who runs the, the operation in Brazil, have done a fantastic job. And, and as I said, the, the volume and the margin and the execution are going extremely well this year. Um, and we couldn't be happier with uh, those results. And, and John, you've also, I mean, I, as we committed when, when we had to describe some of the issues that we've had, we committed about making process improvements around counterparty risk and so forth. Maybe you could just speak just a little bit to, you know, to that. And Olivia has been up to her neck in, in making those improvements as well. So maybe just a moment there too. Yeah, we've, uh, you know, in addition to, you know, a global product line approach, of course, we've, uh, you know, integrated into a center of excellence on global credit as well. And so the, that team the, under Randy Nelson's leadership is, resides right here in IGH. Um, and we're monitoring all of that activity, um, all of those uh, counterparty risk assessments, any credit that's extended, uh, payment terms, everything. Um, and then the team has done just a really a fantastic job of really scouring that uh, top to bottom um, and bringing great visibility to all of us, uh, the entire leadership team um, across the organization. And so it's, it's been a really strong collaborative effort to, to really centralize and pull that together. Um, and it's being managed very, very well. I couldn't be happier. Good, thank you, John. Gary, uh, one, one for you can help me out on, uh, or help the questioner out on, what's the reasoning behind urea market softening up as much as it has in the last 30 days? Uh, and I don't know exactly where this, uh, this question is coming from, uh, geographically. And, and how would you compare today's nitrogen market to where we might see summer fill numbers? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, actually a very astute question because it's a non-traditional market movement. We think about planting happening and then the market resetting, Jay, and this is actually happening when we were still putting corn in the ground. And so uh, definitely nothing that we could have forecast or planned. Uh, we had seen actually large stocks of natural gas grow in the European countries. And so when the stocks go up, the price started to collapse. And we'd seen their price natural of gas. natural gas oh. price, uh, which is the base feedstock for creating a ton of, of nitrogen, um, go down to as low as $1.31 an MMBTU on the Dutch trading markets. And so that's historic record lows. Um, that's encouraged more production to come on. That new production, of course, is at lower values given lower feedstock and lower pricing. And so all of that is the reason that the market has moved, uh, you know, 90 days in advance of what we might expect, but moved down dramatically lower. And it's just a globalization, so it's impacting markets here as well. And to follow up with the question, how do you, how do you see summer field numbers? Do you have a view? Um, you know, I, I don't think we'd be so bold today. Those things are still unfolding. Um, you know, we've seen a little bit of a lift here in the U.S. NOLA's up a bit, uh, but we still know we've got a heavy market globally, Jay. So, so I'd ask, you know, whomever and, and everyone, all our constituents, to just stay close to the crop nutrients team um, and, and look at it daily because the markets are definitely changing every day given, given the circumstances. Okay. Um, Darren, I think uh, probably maybe our final question, unless somebody hands me another one, I think the, um, uh, a, a question around um, future gasoline demands. Can you discuss your thoughts about the long-term strategy investments around gasoline giving a slow but wider acceptance of electric engines and the general arguments for a greener economy? Um, 
didn't see the same issues with diesel, uh, but thinking about investments at the local level in light of that. So kind of looking at your thinking around this area. Yeah, sure. Well, first, uh, you know, agree with, with the writer's uh, kind of assumption that was underneath the question of, of growing acceptance, but slow. And I guess time will tell what slow means, but we are certainly in our own, in our own planning assumptions, as I mentioned earlier, we are planning for a world uh, where this occurs. And essentially gasoline uh, has a bit of a slow, uh, a slow decline. I don't think it goes to zero and we're not planning for that. I think we'll be selling gasoline in the United States for, for quite a while. Uh, but it is certainly not a growth uh, industry and we're not planning it that way. So let me just quickly, how we think about that is investments all the way back up into, into our refinery area where, you know, a few years ago we would have talked about capacity growth investments uh, to serve a market that was maybe flat to growing. Uh, now we think more about investments around efficiency and cost per barrel to compete in a market that does have some, some contraction. Uh, investments that are related to yield and how could we get more diesel yield because we know our system is still, still short diesel versus uh, what we produce. Um, where we're not backing up on, on investment and where I would suggest at the local level, the way you think about it is investment that improves the consumer experience. Uh, and I think that's where the winners are gonna be in, the, in a market that gets really mature around gasoline. The market served, uh, probably not a need for a lot of new facilities unless there's something happening in a local market around housing and, and such. It's really gonna be about the experience a consumer has when they enter a retail facility. And going there for gasoline uh, will over time maybe be less of the reason they go there. They'll go there for food, they'll go there for groceries, they'll go there as their neighborhood stop, uh, maybe even to charge one of their vehicles. And so I would look at investments that improve the consumer experience. That's, that's where the battle's gonna be lost and won. And those facilities that provide that experience, I think will win for a long, long time, uh, regardless of what gasoline demand does. Thanks, Darren. Well, we're gonna bring this session to a close. We scheduled it for an hour, we're right at an hour. Um, I just wanna thank all of you for taking time to join us uh, today in this particular format. Um, I'm really gonna be interested in your comments on, on how you thought about this. Uh, it certainly is not in, pers in person and the, and the benefits that we get from being in person. Uh, at the same time, I was at many of these meetings uh, over 30 years uh, where people you know, drove three hours one way for, for a meeting. And so I guess to some people they might say this, this also has some advantages. Um, today's you know, circumstances required it. Um, um, we are a, a group of people that really likes to be with the people that own us and, and engage personally, um, but we also know that that probably use of technology to communicate more often. Uh, this is gonna be a means that we wanna stay with in certain respects and with certain topics as well. So uh, be interested in your, your feedback on how both you know, things like sound quality and, and, and issues came across to you so that we can, we can do better. I wanna thank all of you for your business. I wanna thank you for your support, uh, support for the management team, support for the board of directors. Uh, we, we appreciate it greatly ask you all to take good care, to stay safe. We depend on you. We will be here for you and have a good and a safe summer. Thank you. <laughs>